Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome. And uh, can we take just a moment to uh, silence? I can't do that. Take just a moment to silence our cell phones, please. Um, I remember I played on a worship team at a church that I attended several years ago, and I would play the piano. And um, I was up in the front of the church, and um, we had just sung a set of songs, and um, we were finished, and the pastor said, let us pray. And my phone rang, and uh, my phone was under the piano bench in my purse, and it was on high volume. And phones these days don't just ring, they play symphonies, you know. So uh, anyway, I never forgot to silence my cell phone again. <clears throat> um, welcome to the 2018 State of the City Address. Um, my name is Jenny Murphy, and I'm the co-owner of Sound Styles. I'm in the center of town. It's a women's clothing boutique. I own the boutique with, together with my, with my mom. We've had it for 32 years. <clears throat> And thank you, Mayor Dave, where did you, oh, there you are, for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's rather brave of you to ask me because I'm not a public speaker. I'm a talker, but not a public speaker. <laughs> and there's a big distinction. And I've never been a Toastmaster. I thought about consulting one when he asked me if I would speak. But I decided that it's just me today and um, me and my thoughts. So I am actually much better sitting out there with all of you than standing up here with only me. But. Um, <clears throat> And my comfort level these days happens to be selling ripped and faded jeans. So anybody interested afterwards, come and see me. Uh, but Mayor Dave came into my shop on one of the very first days of this year and asked me to speak for a few minutes today. I had just set my intention for 2018, which is, quote, to honor myself with all I can do, think, and say, to keep myself positive, moving forward, exploring and growing in faith." Unquote. I had also just chosen my word for the year, which I do every year, and my word this year is explore. Then when he told me the theme for the address today was leave it better than when you arrived, of course I couldn't let myself or my intention down. This theme so resonates with me, so I rose to the challenge to explore it more and agreed to speak. Anyway, thank you again for inviting me and for the privilege. So I grew up in Edmonds. Um, my parents built our family home um, on one and a half acres up on 88th. And um, I was asking my mom, and back then, uh, they built a, a 3,500 square foot home for $20,000. And if my four brothers and I crossed 88th and ran through the neighbor's yard, we'd find ourselves in Maplewood Park where we played unsupervised for hours. And my brothers and I often rode our bikes down Main Street Hill without helmets. <laughs> We'd actually take our feet off the pedals and um, put them up on our handlebars and raise our arms out to the side and coast down the hill. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> you laugh now, but I mean, it was blast back then. Um, and then when, once we got downtown, we would leave our bikes on the sidewalk, and we would go into the Edmonds Bakery for dime donuts. And afterwards, I loved to visit the Edmonds Variety Store, which is kind of a Michael's. Um, they had all these great felt squares and all these bright colors. That was, I, I loved that. And we all attended church and school here. <clears throat> and all that was back when everything downtown closed up neat and tidy at 6 o'clock, or before 6 o'clock, actually. The term Edmonds was alive and well, and I don't even think we knew it back then. <clears throat> but in a nutshell, Edmonds is my stomping ground. You know, I'm a native. Um, like I mentioned earlier, today I'm the co-owner of Sound Styles, the women's clothing store located at the center of town. We opened 32 years ago, and we're told by someone we consulted with that we would never make it that Edmonds wouldn't support a neighborhood clothing store, and that we should go to the mall. Well, I'm still here, and they're not. <clears throat> and, thank you. <clears throat> and now there are 11 clothing stores downtown, and we just had our fourth best sales year ever. So I'll tell you, there's no other place I'd rather do business and with no other folks. I love this place, and I'm grateful to have matured right along with Edmonds. <clears throat> you know, I don't hear it called Deadmonds anymore. But getting back to this leave it better than when you arrived theme, which is not a new one, but a timeless one that is especially important to remember in today's climate where there's so much divisiveness. 
It was John F. Kennedy who said, quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, quote. And Warren Buffett who said, quote, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And in the Bible it says, and let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So with this in mind, I have two short stories to share with you today. First of all, in my family, <clears throat> I grew up with a dad who exemplified this theme. At his memorial service, the gentleman who officiated told this of my dad. He said, Ollie was the type of guy who would go to the well, lower the bucket to get water, only to find very little water left. Nonetheless, he would take just a sip and then place the bucket with its remaining contents on the side of the well for the next thirsty, weary person. My dad was one of those who planted a tree so a fellow human being could later have shade. He was an awesome role model. My second story has a slightly different slant on today's theme, but again, a tree was planted. Shortly after we opened Sound Styles, <clears throat> I was asked to be on the board uh, for the Edmonds Chamber of Commerce. I was such a greenie back then. But there was interest amongst some of the existing board members that the retailers get more involved with the chamber activities, both to grow the chamber membership base and add variety in terms of who the chamber represented. During one of the first board meetings I attended, the subject of wooing retail participation was opened for discussion. Somebody stood up and literally said, why bother? We have the most apathetic group of retailers I've ever seen. Well, I don't know, have you ever had a fire lit under your bum? <clears throat> I had a bonfire due to that comment. Shortly afterwards, four of us retailers got together and formed the Downtown Edmonds Merchants Association that's still really active today. And this I have learned, that leaving it better doesn't happen when I am absorbed in myself. It happens when I'm giving of myself. <clears throat> I am truly privileged to be a part of this community where folks do give of themselves a community that has really matured nicely and steadily, one that seeks solutions, that volunteers a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, that supports their local businesses, that has a government that works together, that believes in the arts, that plants beauty, where we know our neighbors and can be safe, a place where we can feel connected. And while I no longer ride down any hill on a bike, <clears throat> or eat donuts, sorry Ken if you're here. <laughs> now I go to the eye doctor and the chiropractor actually, <laughs> right here in town. <clears throat> um, I do shop with my fellow merchants, regularly attend a downtown community church, catch a movie here and there at the Edmonds Theater, eat in the restaurants, and if I'm lucky I even get to speak at Mayor Dave's state of this fine city's address. Wow, what a great place to have grown up, to live, and to work. And actually, I had two endings to my talk today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the brave one. And I don't know how kosher this is, but I'm going to tell you a joke. I had to write it down so I didn't forget the punchline. <clears throat> my intention to leave you a little better than when I arrived, and in this case, with a bit of humor and a smile. So <clears throat> there was a woman who brought a very limp duck into a veterinary surgeon. As she laid her pet on the table, the vet pulled out his stethoscope and listened to the bird's chest. After a moment or two, the vet shook his head and sadly said, I'm sorry, your duck cuddles has passed away. The distressed woman wailed, are you sure? Yes, I am sure your duck is dead, the vet replied. How can you be so sure, she protested. I mean, you haven't done any testing on him or anything. He might just be in a coma or something. The vet rolled his eyes turned around and left the room. He returned a few minutes later with a black Labrador retriever. As the duck's owner looked on in amazement, the dog stood on his hind legs, put his front paws on the examination table, and sniffed the duck from top to bottom. He then looked up at the vet with sad eyes and shook his head. The vet patted the dog on the head and took it out of the room. A few minutes later, he returned with a cat. The cat jumped up on the table and also delicately sniffed the bird from head to toe. 
<clears throat> um, the cat sat back on its haunches, shook its head, meowed softly, and strolled out of the room. The vet looked at the woman and said, I'm sorry, but as I said, this is most definitely 100% certifiably a dead duck. The vet turned to his computer terminal, hit a few keys, and produced a bill, which he handed to the woman. The duck's owner, still in shock, took the bill. 150 bucks, she cried. 150 bucks just to tell me my duck is dead? The vet shrugged. I'm sorry if you had just taken my word for it. The bill would have been $20. But with the lab report and the CAT scan, it, it's now 150. Yay, laughter. Um, so now it's with my pleasure that I introduce, I think, a really funny guy. I just met him this morning. Yeah, yeah, now you're in for it. I'll, no, never, never mind. Um, so it's with my pleasure that I introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. David Quinn, who's the IB coordinator at Edmonds Woodway High School. So take it away. I get to play Can You Top That Joke? I can't. Uh, welcome, everyone, and, and thanks, uh, Mayor Dave, for inviting me to speak today at this, uh, at this occasion. Um, uh, snowing today, a two-hour snow delay for Edmonds School District, and um, I was at the top of the hill this morning and had to work my way back down, and I was struck by, uh, when, you, when you look at the city from the top of the hill, it doesn't really seem that, that much changes in our view. Um, and I, I was thinking about that. Uh, I was at Edmonds Woodway this morning before I came down, and um, I thought about what it must be like to have been standing there, say, 50 years ago. And you'd be on the corner of, uh, of 76th and 212th, and or there'd be a high school there 50 years ago. I mean, it was gone for a while, and then it came back again. The space was transformed. You, you wouldn't recognize the school for what it is now, but you'd know you were at a school much in the same way as if you came down the hill and went to Edmonds Elementary and now saw that it too was gone, but it had been transformed as well. You might not recognize the name, Francis Anderson, but you'd recognize the spirit inside the building, a spirit of collaboration, creativity, and change. And uh, if there's a theme for me today, it's about transformation, about sometimes the things that change and how they change and why they change. Uh, I'm at a high school, after all. I'm a teacher. Uh, if I stepped into a classroom and believed that nothing would change at the end of the period, I, I probably shouldn't show up in the first place. Because when I work with students, especially young people, and I'm talking to them about ideas and inspiring them, I hope, in some way, or having them inspire me, I'm constantly thinking about that relationship between what is and what will be. I'm very blessed to work for the Edmonds School District and to have a strong Edmonds School Foundation that supports so much of the work that we do in the building. For those of you not familiar, the, uh, the IB program that I'm uh, the coordinator of it stands for the International Baccalaureate Program. It's actually the highest form of diploma that you can receive in the United States. And we offer it to our students in Edmonds for free. I have families who arrive from all over the world and they attend, and some, a couple of years ago, a woman wanted to know where the bill was going to, when I was going to give her the bill, because in the country that she'd come from, uh, they were paying over $20,000 a year to earn an IB education, and here we were offering it to students for free. But even 20 years ago, when our program began, there were only 10 or 12 students in the entire IB program. But much in the way that things are transformed, the Edmonds School District and Edmonds Woodway have been transformed by the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. Because right now, I have over 200 students trying to earn the full IB diploma, and one is leaving the room now. <laughs> you have graduated, young man. Congratulations. <laughs> so with over 200 students in the IB program, each one of them working towards this unique diploma. And in this diploma series, students are asked to not only engage in coursework, 
but to do more than just sit behind a desk. The IB says just being behind a desk isn't enough. You have to get out and be a part of your larger community. And what better community be, to be a part of? Each one of my students will engage in over 150 hours of what's called CAS, which stands for Creativity, Action, and Service. These, these ideas, bigger than just the ones being presented by a teacher, allow a student to get out and explore the world around them, to be a part of the world around them. And as I said, what better city to do that in? To see a city that is always thinking about its own transformation. Uh, one of our local residents, recognizing um, that he wanted to make a statement, a, to create a space, if you will, for folks to get together, to gather, to honor those who have fallen on, on behalf of our country, worked for two years to help to create the Edmonds Veterans Memorial, which just opened this summer. And, and of course, what was our unique connection to it? Well, one of our students said, well, if they're going to make this space, then we should create programming for it. And so Ron Clyborne worked to create Edmonds Veterans Memorial with so many local folks, raising money to create this wonderful space. And then our students showed up this summer and held a music festival there to make the space even more transformed from what it was. And all parts of our city are like that. The Edmund Senior Center will soon become something greater than we could ever have imagined several years ago when it becomes the Edmonds Waterfront Center, transforming the lives of not just the folks who use it on a daily basis, but of the young people who will certainly be there to help understand the stories that come from Edmonds. I'll, I'll leave you with um, a few thoughts about the nature of transformation. I was an actor in New York. Somebody told me that I could be a teacher, and I decided to make that journey for myself. I kind of did it kind of fearlessly, to be, to be honest. Uh, I was afraid that making that transformation would change me in a way that I wouldn't recognize. But the work that I do with students every day transforms me. And um, it, helps, it, it helps to make my life better. When you wake up every day in Edmonds, you can complain about the lack of parking. But, <laughs> but recognize that that's a positive transformation for our city, because empty streets would have businesses that were empty, and full streets have businesses that are full. Your life can be full in that same way. Waking up, making a decision to be transformed by the day. I'll leave you with a quote from a, a writer by the name of Yuval Noah Harari. He wrote a book called The Brief History of Humankind. He says, we have advanced from canoes to galleys to steamships to space shuttles, but nobody knows where we're going. We are more powerful than ever before, but have very little idea of what to do with all that power. Self-made gods with only the laws of physics to keep us company, we are accountable to no one. We are consequently wreaking havoc on our fellow animals and on the surrounding ecosystem, seeking little more than our own comfort and amusement, yet never finding satisfaction. Is there anything more dangerous than dissatisfied and irresponsible gods who don't know what they want? When you wake up tomorrow morning, think about what you want. Is it just for you, or is it for a city? Is it for a people? Is there a way that you can be involved in the lives of the people around you, if only for a few minutes? Could it be 20 minutes volunteering? Could it be an hour working with young people? Could it be a day working at fundraising for our community? Think about that day, that gift you've been given, and transform yourself and our city. Thank you. It's my absolute honor, it really is the honor of the day, to introduce our mayor, Dave Rowling. Well, good morning. Welcome to beautiful downtown Edmonds, where it's always sunny and 82 degrees. <laughs> As I tell people, I have to keep it that way in my head. Because there are those days uh, where you wonder, 
if it's sunny and 82 degrees. It's always fabulous to see so many familiar faces, and I love it when I see new bright and shining faces here. This for the uninitiated is my sixth State of the City presentation. Before we go too far in the program, let me ask you to once again give a great round of applause for our two previous speakers, Jenny Murphy from Sound Styles and David Quinn from Edmonds Woodway High School. I've been assured when David leaves the room, and it will be before I'm finished, that it's not because he's angry at me. He has another obligation at the high school, so he'll step out here at some point. Um, we have some dignitaries here and a few elected officials, and if I don't read your name off, you got here too late, I didn't see you. <laughs> Uh, but the people who are here, and I do want to acknowledge, is Diana White, who's uh, on the school board, um, Neil Tibbet and Dave Teitzel from the Edmond City Council, Nicholas Smith, the mayor of Edmond. Or, <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Dave. But, but it's right here in the script. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and there are a couple of other folks I'd like to recognize. They have leadership roles that are important to our community. Emmett Heath, who is the CEO of Community Transit. Robin Fenn, who is the CEO from Burdent. And Dr. Chris McDuffie, who is the head of our Edmond School District. I, I actually, thank you very much. Yeah. As we did last year, we once again have Tim Corey from Calibri Facilitation here to produce a visual history of accomplishments and challenges in and around Edmonds. When we finish today, come on up and have a look at his work. We had this last year that is absolutely mind-bending uh, to see what he can do while we're just sort of rattling away up here. But uh, come up and have a look because it's a great visual depiction of the work that we we'll talk about this morning. I mentioned in the beginning, this is my sixth state of the city presentation. Previous presentations have pretty much followed a predictable pattern. I want to change things up a bit though today to focus on some various elements around us which are asking us to think differently about Edmonds and its role in the community experiencing change and how we in South Snohomish County the county at large and the region will adapt along with Edmonds to think about the bridge I reference in the opening uh, title. Um, the bridge is a word that I choose when thinking about how we encapsulate many changes we see in our city and region and how we bridge from the recent past to acknowledge the dynamic forces which are moving us forward. Over the years, my executive assistant, Carolyn Lefebvre, has been asked many times, who writes the mayor's speeches? I'm asked that sometimes, too. Um, I couldn't help when I saw Pearls Before Swine in a Sunday cartoon that came out the Sunday before the State of the Union speech. So I show you this cartoon today and assure you, I write my own material. <laughs> I cannot, however, speak for the President of the United States. Um, today I want to, to divide the presentation into six main topics, which will have some traditional information, but at the same time, have us think in broader terms. They are, as you can see, Demographics, expansion, Edmonds, a daytime destination, history, major projects, and a challenge. I know sometimes a painful message for some is that our region is going through an enormous growth change. Because we live in an incredible energetic region with dynamic economy, major industries of all types, and a wonderful place to play. Those amenities and energy, our region has become a hotspot in the United States. 
Most of you have heard me speak before regarding the raw numbers we can expect in population, jobs, and housing by 2035. That's, it's not very far away, really. 220,000 more people in Snohomish County alone. 5,500 more people in the city of Edmonds. And we will need to anticipate 1,000 more jobs here, as well as another 1,200 housing units. It's a little frightening for some people to think about. I want to help you along with a little more visual information, just some raw numbers and information for you to consider to help understand why we feel growth and change coming at us almost on a daily basis. Look at uh, just these numbers are pretty stunning. Job growth here in, in, uh, in the region. 34% job growth between 2000 and 2016 in Snohomish County. 23% in Pierce and it goes on down from there. Look at the population growth here in our four county region. Central Puget Sound has grown 24% in that same 16 year period. Washington State, 20%. And the United States, a little over 13%. The astonishing number to me is since 2000, Snohomish County is growing 30% faster than the other counties. We, we have grown that much, 30%. Uh, in the last 16 years. More locally, Edmonds has grown just under 4%, Mount Lake Terrace under 2%, and Linwood under 9%. Linwood is just trying to hog everything. <laughs> <laughs> but some more uh, de demographic information, which I think is important, important for us to think about. The baby boomers will age up, if you will, uh, in 2018. 72 year old baby boomers are no longer baby boomers. And then people over 65 are the fastest growing age group in the nation. We're just living too damn long. <laughs> in the city of Edmonds, people 65 and over make up 21.1% of the population compared to the county, which is 12%. Pretty stunning numbers. And of course, our demographics are changing in other ways. We, in, in the year 2000, we had a little over 12% minorities in our greater community. And by the end of 2016, we were at 18, 19%. If you look at the population and employment projections, you see that Edmonds is on the low end of that as far as population growth and as far as employment growth is predicted. And actually, I'm comfortable with that, and we'll talk about this a couple of more times. Our community is generally considered to be pretty well built out. Property line to property line, we're pretty well built out in our community. Um, but I, I still find the 21% employment growth to be really a key for the success of the community. What are the trends? Well, about every five minutes, it seems to me, technology changes. When I got up this morning, it was different than when I went to bed. Probably wait 10 minutes and we have more traffic. You wait maybe up to a half hour and we'll have more people and more jobs. We have other challenges we need to think about. Edmonds is an expensive place to rent or to purchase. And we need to work on filling the affordability gap that we now have. We are cre increasingly aware of the social needs that we have, whether it's income inequality, homelessness, opiate addiction, cost of college and so on. You mix that into the technology, traffic, and people and more jobs that we talked about, and we have some trends that we really need to think about. More demands on local government, parentheses, and federal government support is less. That's a pet, I won't give a lecture on that, but that really bothers me because 
The feds pay for about as much as they can, and then they hand it down to the states who do the same thing, who hand it down to the counties. And guess what the lowest common denominator is? We are now involved with social programs that we were never intended, at least in the traditional view, for cities to do. I'm supposed to keep you safe and pave your roads. We also have challenges, as you know, with the environment, with air and water quality. We need to be sure that we keep both. We have changing demographics, which we've talked about a bit. We have more transit, and we will need more transit. We have uh, the need for mixed-use, pedestrian-friendly communities. And that just doesn't mean downtown Edmonds. That means what's happening at Westgate, what's happening on Highway 99, what's happening in Five Corners. They all need to think of themselves, and we need to help develop the idea that they are, in fact, a neighborhood. So what are we doing to try and deal with it? Well, we're planning ahead. Um, and then we're also taking action, which is the other piece of it that's more important than thinking about things. Highway 99, that two and a half mile stretch from the county line up to 212, we're engaged in improving that, and we'll talk about that just a bit in a few more minutes. We have enormous infrastructure needs that we have to continually address. Our storm sewer, our storm sewer system, roads resurfacing, water and sewer lines needing to be, per, per, uh, to be changed. Uh, it's really kind of a daunting task to undertake uh, we have a housing strategy. Uh, we actually have a housing task force that I started last year and will um, be actively involved and probably give us the end of their results, their study, uh, later this year. Uh, we need, as I say, uh, to continue the use of transit. We have a lot of north-south connectors in, well, in the region, I-5, 405, uh, Highway 99. There's a real focus now, in, like community transit, we're focusing on east-west connectors because we know that we need to get people to the spine and we know that we're going to need more transit to do that. So community transit and the other transit agencies are really focused on that. Um, and as I mentioned before, we need to do more planning, but more important to me, is go ahead and plan, but then let's implement things because we need to show progress. So, we know that we've got goals we have to meet for, uh, for homes, uh, for jobs, and for more people moving in. So how do we do this? Expansion may not be the exact right word, but how do we adapt to the, what we know is coming? Well, how about Westgate? How about that? Have any of you driven by there lately? They picked up their permits two weeks ago, and they're in the ground producing the first building up at, at Westgate that will have us 91 units and, what, 7,500 square feet of, no, 3,000 square feet of additional retail space. That's the first step in that area, finally having an opportunity to become a walkable neighborhood. And I see that as a, just a, a key for all of us. We need to have walkable neighborhoods. This will be a fabulous addition to the community. You know about Post Office 2, down on what, 2nd and Main. Uh, they're putting in the second leg of what they'd already anticipated doing, the apartments units just to the north. This will be another 28 new resident, residential uses use units and 7,600 square feet of retail. Graphite Studios across the street. What a great addition this will be to the community. It'll add to the artist uh, environment that we have with artist studios and art gallery, gallery, cafe, and three apartments. What about Toyota? Have you been up on uh, Highway 99 and see the development they're doing there? It's stunning. I was up there a couple of weeks ago and walked the property as they were putting up the walls. Uh, but it's going to be just an absolute fabulous addition to our community. Madrona School is being built now. It's being built right next to the old one. 
when they finish the new school, they'll move the students over. And I'm not sure, what are you going to do with the old building? I, figure it out, Chris, and let me know. Point Edwards, another 68 residential units. Cedar Creek Memory Care. If you don't know where that's at, it's off of 212, just north of 212 on 72nd. I've walked that property a couple of times too. It's going to be fabulous and will be a great addition to our medical community. And how about the fact that this is a town that's all built out. We issued last year 60 new housing permits, single family residents. So there's still places that we can find patches of ground where we will continue uh, adding to, to the community. So let's then move along to something that I feel quite strongly about and I'm absolutely delighted with. And that is, I believe that Edmonds is becoming a flattering, beginning to have a, rep, a reputation of being a destination community. I believe that passionately because I've seen the changes that have taken place over the many years uh, since I've lived here. Uh, we talk to people weekly from across the region who, frustrated with the intensity, the congestion, and the daily stress of large cities, come to Edmonds as a daytime retreat. Our great small friendly shops, our glorious waterfront and parks, our fabulous restaurants are many opportunities to participate in the arts and our culture atmosphere, all lead to folks wanting a bit of a retreat and it adds to the allure of our community. But wait a minute, there is more. Remember in one of my earlier slides, we talked about baby boomers aging up. Isn't that an ugly term, aging up? <laughs> and 21% of our population is in that aged up category. My view is, so what? Maybe because I, I'm in that category. But I value the age, wisdom, and experience they bring to the community. Having our younger families mixed with our aged up group, in my view, is a great asset to the community. Besides, that means 79% are here from the under aged up category for us to work with, along with the 21%. Shoot folks, 10 to 15 years ago, you came downtown during the day and you couldn't find a baby stroller anywhere. It's changed quite a bit, hasn't it? Or if you came downtown at six o'clock or after 10 to 15 years ago, you could park anywhere you wanted to. How about now? And believe it or not, I'm actually happy about that because that means people are buying things and we are generating revenue and adding, I think, to the allure of the community. The point is, the same, with, with the same shopping, restaurants, waterfront, parks, and arts, our local 79 percenters are an important part of our daytime destination. Remember that, we the locals are an important part of being the regional destination. We, the 79% and the 21% are the core of this destination. The last point I want to raise in regards to the Edmonds as a destination, regionally or locally, is the gathering places and celebrations that we have in our community. Where there are many coffee shops, restaurants, the 4th of July celebration, the arts festival, summer market, tree lighting ceremony, or the ECA. We are a community which gathers and we know each other. We have a community unlike most communities in the Puget Sound Basin. Again, we are the core and a part of being a destination. Unless we forget, adding to the destination has to do with our magnificent walkable waterfront area, including the port, the many restaurants, Harbor Square, Jacobson Marine, our coming improvements to the Edmonds Marsh, Salish Crossing, including uh, the outstanding Cascadia Art Museum. And believe it or not, folks, <laughs> I 
I think they're about to open if they haven't already. I actually went down the other day and I think they're actually doing the finishing work. So if they're not open, they will be. And we'll have another day that we can gather together. All of this helps us understand the many lures our community possesses for Edmonds as a daytime destination, be it the locals or the area tourists or the regional daytime visitors. Let's spend a minute or two talking about the history of Edmonds. Kind of an odd thing to put into a state of the city speech because we have a 127 year old uh, history here. And if you don't know, we are the oldest city in Snohomish County. But not typically something that you do talk about in the state of the city speech. I want to emphasize how important even the changes in population and resulting community shifts we have coming. The council and I know maintaining that low profile neighborhood feel of our downtown business core is important to all of us. We today hear citizens worry we will become Ballard-like, whatever in the hell that is, <laughs> or Kirkland-like. Um, in other words, being a changed community, which will then lose the characteristic and charm of what we now have. It might be good to show you just a few things on how we've changed, but more importantly to me, how we haven't changed. First of all, I'm going to show you a picture from 1906. I don't expect the theater to be here when I show you this, uh, but it really begins to show you what, what the community was like at about 6th and Main in 1906. Not many cars roaming around. I wonder why. Um, and if you see the horses out there, they're actually leveling the street, they have a device behind that could sort of take the rough edges out of the community. The important thing is though, if you look at this closely and study it, there are some of these buildings that are still here. So then let's look at, um, oh, I know, we're talking about always being together. I wanna show you a photo from the early 1940s of the community coming together and working together. World War II, important. There was a, evidently a call put out to bring in all of your medals so that we could use them in the war. The community brought all this stuff in together. I don't know how long it took them to clean it up, but uh, it's gone now. <laughs> As important though, look across the street. Chantrell. Housewares. Buildings are still there. They haven't taken them all out. Let me show you from 5th and Main, looking west, a 1938 photo of the town. Lots of cars. That hasn't gone away. But if you look at the buildings, many of those buildings are still in place. You're sitting in the Princess Theater today. Across the street is the Edmonds Bakery. We've heard about donuts from Edmonds Bakery. And as you look down the street, you can see many of those buildings are still in place. Let's compare that to a 2018 photo from a roughly the same place. Still lots of cars. And guess what? Still lots of the same buildings. The idea that we're going to tear everything down and build skyscrapers evidently is not in the genes of the city of Edmonds. And I think that's reassuring for those people who worry that we're here to rape and pillage. Another photo I want to show you is probably from the late 50s or early 60s. This will be looking north on Fifth Avenue. There's the Edmonds bookshop. There's the Lida building where Starbucks is. Across the street is the travel store. At the end of the street is uh, the Mexican restaurant. All of those buildings still there. Changes, yes, but basically still downtown Edmonds with many of the same characteristics that we had 60 or 70 years ago. The photos I just showed you will always have some of you want to have the days back of slower times, less congestion, the way it used to be. I think though most of you now understand that we will have to find positive ways to adjust to the reality which is coming our way. 
I've tried to suggest to you that we have a new reality, but, but we are doing what we can to anticipate that reality. Let me give you some additional big picture projects to help you understand what I mean by building the bridge. We have uh, four very large visionary city of Edmonds projects, which will be a focus for staff and community in the coming years. And they are the senior center slash community center, the civic field re redevelopment, Highway 99 vision, and the waterfront connector. We already heard about the, what is not going to be called the Senior Center slash Community Center, which I'm delighted with, but will be called the Edmonds Waterfront Center. The site that is up here is where, where the current Senior Center stands on a property owned by the City of Edmonds. This will be a transformational project. We've heard that word a couple of times. On the waterfront was senior use during the daytime and citywide use, all age groups from late afternoon to evening. With the Anderson Center bursting at the seams and the current senior center with the same problems, this new facility will provide a spectacular setting for our community to have a true intergenerational facility. Civic Center. Civic Center is, of course, an opportunity for us, for you folks here in the room, to leave um, a legacy for future generations. Just as 80 or 100 years ago, City Park was left for us. It's just a great opportunity for us to have a transformational project on eight acres in downtown Edmonds. Highway 99, the project will take years to complete and will cost millions of dollars. The state has granted $10 million to begin the project, most programmed for 2021 to 2023. What the hell good is it gonna do me for the program it that far out? Well, anyway, they had to do it that way, I understand. And we have been successful though in pulling a million dollars forward from that $10 million so that we can do advanced planning for this important project, and that work is underway. The waterfront connector. All of you know uh, that we have the train coming through town occasionally, occasionally 40 times a day, and that really blocks Dayton and Main Street for up to two hours a day. The dramatic $30 million project will allow 24-7 emergency access to the port, fire trucks, aid cars, uh, if they need to get over there. So they can get down to the port, to the businesses, and to the ferry, should both Main and Dayton, be, Dayton streets be blocked. In extreme situations, the ferry could also load and unload ferries. You look at that real closely, folks. It's a one-lane road. It'll be for emergencies only for people to load and unload ferries if it happens the five or six times a year that we do have to deal with that. But it also allows, the good thing is it to be pedestrian and bike access 24-7 the rest of the time. We will need state and federal dollars to complete the project. I hope that's obvious. We don't have $30 million laying around in our bank account. These four undertakings, while large and costly, are important improvements for the long-term vitality to, to the community and to the region. While Edmonds will provide some dollars for the projects, the vast majority of costs will come from state and federal funding, along with, on some of the projects, foundation grants and private citizens. So, all the good news, but then we do have some challenges. And the first challenge I want to mention is what I just mentioned is a terrific opportunity. Inasmuch as they will take, con the, the projects we talked about will take years to put in place. They'll have vigilance from the city. We'll have to pursue it by the city and the citizens. We have a strong start on all four of those projects. 
with support from the state, federal government, and official and local officials. But we'll need to keep the projects fresh in all of our minds. Other major challenges that we need to face. Maintaining a strong economy so that we, that is the government, can help meet the expectations that all four, all of you folks have for the community. You want a high quality of life. Guess what? We're going to have to keep revenue coming. As you may recall, unlike Linwood, we do not have, um, we do not have big box stores. We do not have shopping malls. So we've got to be pretty creative. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Wouldn't you agree, Nicola? Thank you very much. <laughs> And though we do need to continue our efforts, as we've already mentioned a couple of times, we need to create affordable housing in this city. Westgate is a good example of what's coming there. 91 units, 20% of which will be below market rates. That's part of the obligation that we got with the developer. Uh, and we know that we will have below market rates for 20% of those 91 units. And that's the theme that we need to get to so that we can maintain that on areas like Highway 99 when we redevelop that, or maybe even five quarters. Those kinds of local neighborhoods like that, we can find ways to provide affordable neighborhoods. We also need to address the homelessness and opioid epidemic. Even though we've begun to address this issue, it needs to be addressed and solved regionally. The council has set aside $500,000 to begin efforts, but they need to work, we need to work across the county with others to bring real and more permanent solutions. And that collaboration is in fact underway. Sometime this year, you will get an opportunity to vote to increase your taxes again. We have an infrastructure piece that we've got to solve, and it's called SIRS. Now, how many of you know what SIRS is? Well, it surprises me there's more than 12. <laughs> but it really stands for Snohomish Emergency Radio System. It's the way we communicate across the county in certain kinds of emergency situations. We have radio, we have towers all through the county in which we can call for 911 and other important communication systems. The system that we've had in place for around 20 years is beginning to fail. We're going to have to replace it. And that's a voting issue you're going to find out more and have to deal with in your own personal way. First, and I think I just want to spend really a few minutes talking about finances. I usually spend a fair amount of time talking about our city finances. Today I'll be fairly brief by reporting that with a very strong economy, some good work from my directors and our staff, and some of the strong new businesses who have come to town, I will only report we've had another record-setting revenue year. Over the past six years, the staff and I, along with the council, have worked hard to bring the city finances back from what I think was in a very unhealthy place six years ago. Frankly, while I think we will have another very strong financial year, there are a few early signs the economy may be beginning to level off or even slow a bit. Good example, car sales. Still very good, but they're probably down 8 to 10 percent from last year. Another caution is interest rates have begun to move up a bit. However, assuming that strong year, I will once again set aside additional reserves and hope the council will join me. We all know the economy will not hold at a yearly record pace every year. The question is always, how deep will the down cycle be and when? In closing, at the end of the State of the City presentation last year, I closed with a message I saw on a t-shirt in Hawaii uh, which had a, a really lasting impact on me. It's, it's really, for me, um, an important message for me to keep in my mind. And that message is, leave it better than when you arrived. 
That for me, and I'm guessing for you, is a message and goal we can all seek. As you saw in the opening slide, this is the theme I wanted to build the pres presentation around today. With the addition of building the bridge. I, believing, I believe leaving it better than when you arrived leads us to providing the bridge for future generations to experience the joy of what we have made better today. As I always say at the end of every State of the City presentation, I am gratified and proud to be mayor of Edmonds, Washington. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. Well, I only had one joke, and I already told it to you, but, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming out today. And thank you, Mayor Day, for your dedication to our, our great city. Um, go ahead and turn your cell phones on and have a great day. And please come down and view the scribe's work. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome. Thank you.